All right, we are in a series called It Is Written, talking about the Bible, and uh, I just want to get into it today. Uh, before we do that, I want to mention a few things. We've been going through this series and basically talking about how do we know the Bible is true, how can you trust it. I'm not going to re-preach those. I encourage you to go to cornerstonecheshire.com uh, and catch up on it. We're looking to get uh, iTunes and Spotify and all that going, hopefully in the next month, and you can subscribe and you can get those weekly. That's the next thing we're working on. But uh, we've been talking about how can you trust the Bible? And how do you know this is the Word of God? Isn't it something a bunch of guys put their hands all over? You can't trust it. We've evolved as a culture. Come on, really? And so we talked about, we dealt with a lot of those questions. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's such great evidence to know that this is authentic to its original writing. And we believe it is the Word of God. And I believe, personally, based upon the research I've done and based upon experience, that it takes more faith not to believe it isn't the Bible than it does to believe and I'm convinced of that. And, uh, and not just me, but millions of other people. This is the Word of God. And so we're going to talk about why it is. All right, so let's get right into our message today. I'm going to review a few things, and that's always, we always have a launching pad for the series. That's something I want to make sure that we all get in our minds. And so we repeat something over and over again for that reason. And it's simply this. There's some basic fund foundations that help us to understand about this. First of all, the most powerful source in the universe, in every realm, is the Word of God, okay? We also said that Jesus is the Word and the foundation of all things. And we mentioned in Colossians, for by Him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through Him and for Him, all right? And here's the big point here. And He is before all things. In other words, he is both the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Before there was time, he was. Okay, he is and always will be God. And so he was before all things. Now this is the part I want to help us to remember is this. He's before all things and in him, as in Christ, all things hold Together, all things hold together. And it's not an analogy, it's not an illustration, it is an actual scientific fact. The seat you're sitting in right now, the molecules are vibrating at such a rate of speed or whatever that you're not falling through the chair. Why? Because there's something in the molecules that hold the chair together. What is it? It's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. What do you mean? Absolutely. There is a, a life force. It sounds like I'm talking about the, the Star Wars coming on December 20th. Did you buy your tickets yet? I haven't. But anyhow, I'm not talking about the force from Star Wars. But what I'm talking about, there is the Spirit of Christ that holds the universe together. Not only that, it holds your life together. And it's supernatural and it's true and it's available to everyone here today. When you violate and you pull Jesus out of his structure, what happens is, Disorder begins to happen, and catastrophic things begin to happen. And so uh, it's amazing, everybody. We've been talking about it weekly. I want to get right back into our theme verse, okay? With that in mind, that he holds it all together, Jesus says something very clear to us today. He says, everyone, that means your neighbor, right? Everyone, not you, but no, you as well. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts him into practice. Not enough just hearing it here. Not just enough of uh, hearing it, getting it in your mind, but we want to get it from here to here to our hearts, and then eventually, this is when it really begins to happen, our hands. Head, heart, hands. That's the progression we want to go through. And so if you really want to learn something, I don't know, I'm a hands-on learner, and how you are. You can show me something all day long, but until I actually put my hands on it and make it happen, you can show me how to do the mouse and how to put the program together, but I, I, this is the way I am. I have to literally do it myself, and that's the best way to learn. So anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them to practice is like the wise man. Conversely, and everyone who hears these words, see, it's the same. Hears, hears. Hears these words of mine, but does not do them. Oh, yeah, I understand it. Yeah, I get it, but are you doing it? Uh, will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the winds blew and the beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And basically we're saying this, how do you make decisions in your life? How do you know what's right and wrong? 
And we believe it's the word of God. The word of God is the final foundation. It's what we listen to. It's what we believe in. It does not contain the word of God. It is the word of God. And what it says we have to, we have to stand upon. If you do not stand upon the word of God, what you're doing is you're undermining the very foundation and the very structure of your life, which will bring catastrophic results. Not because God's angry with you, because you violate his creation. We talked about this in our, our series called Living a Life of Ten. We mentioned that moral law is not just moral law. It literally is a law. And if you violate it, whether you're a believer or not, you're going to have consequences both good and bad if you do it or if you don't do it. All right. So what I want to mention to you is that a lot of people are saying a lot of things today saying it doesn't matter what you believe. And so I have an illustration here today that uh, Jangle, if I said it correctly, I appreciate my children putting it together for me and also the worship team. Thank you, worship team. And so here is the tower. I'm supposed to pull this thing out. Oh, okay, here we go. It's already falling apart. All right, so here is the, it's a great game, by the way, and what you do is you put this thing together and you start pulling the blocks out. And it doesn't fall, and then right now it's on the top of the Word of God. So you have this, and we start pulling the blocks out. A lot of people are saying lots of things today. People are saying it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Okay, I can do whatever I want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and oh, all tight, all pretty tight. I take one here. Okay, I'm going to take that away. I know the Bible says that you should forgive. But I mean, what my dad did to me is unforgivable. What my ex-husband did for me is unforgivable. I'm never going to forget. I'm always going to remember. But the Bible says, <laughs> yeah. In my case, it's a lot different. So you take another one. Oh, boy. The kids put it together really well. Okay. Here's another one. It doesn't make a difference. Love makes a family. It doesn't matter who you marry. It doesn't make a difference what you do. In fact, there is no gender. It's fluid. Now, I understand. I'm going to step on some toes here, and I'm sorry to do that, everybody, but there is truth. I just read an article this past week. It disturbed me so greatly. I need to bring it up to you, okay? Please understand. I'm not saying it because I'm upset, upset with anyone. It's only by God's grace. But there's a seven-year-old boy, uh, a custody battle. And the mother says, this seven-year-old boy is not a boy. It's a girl. So we're going to have a surgery and eliminate his male parts. I thought it was fake news. You know, I always back, you always got to, it's not fake news. It's real. Now, think about that for a moment. What does a seven-year-old child know? I mean, I, I, I don't know if I should have Fruit Loops or Captain Crunch at seven years old. I thought I was Luke Skywalker at seven years old, right? Well, I mean, I had a lot of ideas what I was. What does a child know when they're seven years old? It's abuse. It's horrific. With it. I'm like, surely this cannot be true. And it is. Insane. Insanity. How can this happen? How can our culture do this? Because you know what? It doesn't make a difference because we say it's this. So even though the Bible says this, I'm pulling this one out too. And we keep on pulling more and more and more out. I know that I, I, I listen, I, the government does abortions. We're against abortion. And I know that we're paying taxes and taxes are going for evil. So I am not, I'm, what I do is I tithe. I tithe on what I don't give to the government. So this is something I make under the table, and the government does not need that. Wouldn't it be better for the church or support missionaries? So I'm not going to pay my taxes. But the Bible says, render unto Caesar's what Caesar's and what God is God. Oh, I know that. But in this set of circumstance, it's a little bit different. So I'm taking this out too. You know, that, man, that person, they're jerks. I hate their guts. I'm so much better than they are. Don't you know that only by grace you've been saved, not of yourself? Ah, oh, no, that person's messed up. So I do take that too. And the next thing you know, you start taking out these various things. And the light starts to fall apart, and you just kind of ignore it. Now everything's fine. Everything's fine. Okay. Okay, God. You know, God can never use me. For what I did was unforgivable. I'm not good enough for God. So I'll come to church, but man, what I did when I was 22 years old, God's never going to forget that. So I'm just going to pull that out. You know, I, listen, God wants me happy, right? I'm in a loveless marriage. My spouse treats me terrible. I'm under verbal abuse. They tell me, that, they tell me uh, all sorts of things. And you know what? The person at work, man, they're really nice to me. They listen to me. They're in a loveless marriage too. And I know that the Bible says that, but in this set of circumstances, 
it's a little bit different. And so I know the Bible says what God has drawn together and let no man put apart, but this is different because I, made, I married the wrong person. And so I'm going to go ahead. And what begins to happen is your life comes crashing down. Why? God, what are you doing to me? Why am I experiencing this? Because when you pull Jesus out of your life, things fall apart. Listen, I know I stepped in a bond of toes. I know I'm saying, I'm saying not politically correct things, but who cares? Because you know what? We live by the truth. We got to live by the truth, everybody. You know what? It's, it's abuse. Uh, a little while ago, uh, about a couple years ago, uh, my wife and I were walking. We like to go walking. and It means we're getting old because we like to go walking. <laughs> but we like to go walking. And, uh, and I, man, my back bothers me. I told my wife, I said, something itches behind me. She said, what is it? Ah, it's nothing. She goes, you should see the doctor. Nah, it's fine. It's fine. No, you should see the doctor. I don't want to see the doctor. All they want to do is take my money. We have a health savings account. So I try to, I mean, I have to practically be dying before I go to the doctor, right? Because I don't want to spend any money in the health savings account because we can use it for braces, which are not covered on our insurance plan. You don't need to know that, but I'm just showing you why I think the way I think. <laughs> so she says, you need to go. So in the middle of the walking path, she calls, uh, we were at Farmington River. We're, we're walking along there and uh, drinking our Give Coffee, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, give Coffee is awesome. I just want to give a plug out to them. Anyhow, so... <laughs> If you're hearing me, give me free coffee. So we're, we're having that. She calls the doctor. I go to the doctor, doctor uh, our doctor in New Haven. Our doctor goes, that doesn't look too good. I want to send you to a dermatologist. Oh, come on. All right. I'll go to the, I'll go to the dermatologist. I'm like, let's get this over with. Doesn't look too good. I'm going to take it off. What? Can we do it next? No, I'm going to take it off. Takes a little, takes it off. Takes a sample. We go on vacation. It's spring break. We're going to go to, we're in Florida. We're having a great time. The second day of vacation, I get a phone call from the doctor. You need to call me back. So I call him back. Oh, by the way, uh, you have melanoma cancer. I say, what, Willis? What? You have melanoma cancer. We have to, we have to do, but don't worry about it. You're fine. It's the most deadly, one of the most deadly cancers known to man. What do you mean take it? I read about it. If it metastasizes, I'm dead. He said, no, don't worry about it. You're probably okay. But we got to take it surgery. So I enjoyed the rest of my vacation in Florida. It was fantastic. I had a wonderful time. Guess what I thought about every, uh, do I have enough insurance? What's gonna, how are the kids gonna go to, how are the kids gonna grow up? And how is my wife, my wife, how is she gonna survive without me? She probably can't, know it's fine, how about the kids? I start thinking of all this stuff, right? Now what would have happened if I said, you know what? That's judgmental. How can you say that I should go to see the doctor? I'm fine, it's just a little mark. What would have happened to everybody? I'd probably be going for chemotherapy right now. Or maybe on my deathbed. If I did not listen to the truth of what the, my wife said and the doctor said, I would probably be in chemotherapy or dead. How judgmental. No, it's your life. You pull the word of God out. Oh, by the way, what happened to me? You were okay. Oh, let me finish the rest of the story. I'll tell you next week. No, I'll tell you now. Um, so we, we, um, we went to the doctor and uh, I went to the doctor's office and they did in. They did, a, they did a procedure. That's a nice, that's an adult way of saying they cut you open, but they don't want to say it. I had a procedure done. And uh, like my new nose? No, I'm just kidding. So I had a procedure done. And uh, what they did, it took about three Italian meatballs out of my back. It was lovely. And I have it on video. Guys, go ahead and, just go ahead and show that. Oh. <laughs> I'm fine. No chemotherapy, thank the Lord. But I go for a body scan every four months because I have to. You know, so, and I stay out of the sun. And I love the sun, so, but I'm, I'm doing fine. But that's an example, everybody. If you ignore the truth, it's not hateful. It's love. It's love. So this is what Jesus talks about. Now, how do we get the word of God to transform us? And a lot of people are like, man, I, I just don't get anything in the Bible. I read it, and I'm like, ah, I, I, don't, I don't understand the Bible. And Oh, can we just start from really something really simple? It's not in my notes, but I'm going to mention it to you real quick. Um, a lot of people say this to me. It's got to be the King James Version or that's it. Because after all, the Apostle Paul used the King James Version. Well, Apostle Paul did not use the King James Version. First of all, King James Version was written in 1600, Shakespearean English. Does anyone talk that way today? It's beautiful. It sounds wonderful. It's nice to memorize. Oh, Vaust, beautiful one, I betroth myself unto you. You're, I can't even talk that way, right? It sounds really poetic. 
But no one speaks that way anymore. It's, that's four, 500 year old language, right? And so what is the Bible? The Bible is written in three basic languages. Hebrew, Old Testament, Aramaic, and Greek. And so what a translator has to do is it has to go to those original sources, translate it into the language you have. That's it, everybody. And so some of the King James Version, it's a good version, mind you, but we found even older manuscripts than what the King James Version had at the time. And there's some great translations out there that are accurate. Granted, there's something lost in translation. That's why it's good. I studied Greek and Hebrew. I'm a lot better at Greek than I am Hebrew. I'm not very good at Hebrew, but Greek I'm fairly good at. And there's a lot of study aids, and it really helps to understand the language. Something is lost. You ever try to tell a joke in another language? It just doesn't fall. I was another, um, that's another time. So, but anyhow, so if you've got to be very careful about that, so you have to translate. And so there are good translations. Let me go ahead. If you want to take notes, I'll, I'll hand over a source next week to you, everybody, to help you out. Okay? But a good translation, by the way, is a New American Standard is very good. It's accurate to the original uh, Greek and Hebrew. It's a little wooden. It doesn't flow as well, but it's good. New King James Version is a decent one. Um, also, ESV, English Standard Version, good translation of the Bible. And then there's other ones out as well. The NIV is okay. Um, there's a Bible out right now that's taking out gender. That's, not a, that's, that's heretical. So you're basically taking our father and mother who are in heaven. I mean, come on, give me a break. Because that's not the Bible. Uh, there are other scriptures. They take out the male pronouns and put them. I get that, but you should at least put an asterisk and say that the original says um, Adam or whatever. Does that make sense? At least tell them that so you know that. So uh, there's different versions out there. And then there's one I like a lot called New Living Translation. Really, really well done. It, it gives the equivalency. It's, like a more, it's not a paraphrase. It's, it's a translation, but it kind of does the equivalency. And it's really easy to read. It's well done. And I encourage that one. That one's good. But have another Bible next to you. And go on a computer like at eastsword.com or uh, you can go on to... Um, um, by, uh, U version, by the way, that has study Bibles. It's got Greek and Strong's uh, Concordance in there. I, my friends, there's so many tools for us today to read the Word of God. Okay, so we'll give you some ref, uh, things those next week. They'll give you some references next week that we'll hand out to you that you can see. We mentioned the fact of the matter is the BibleProject.com. Amazing, well done, well trusted. Now let's uh, rest of our time here today. How the Word transform you? How do you get the Word from here? To hear, to hear, to hear. All right, so let's get right into it. Number one, I must accept the Bible's authority. Okay, this is the final authority. Uh, I don't care if you're in a loveless marriage. I, actually, I do care, but uh, work on your marriage. Okay, I understand that. But I just can't leave my wife because God wants me happy. Where's that in the Bible? And, you know, I can't forget that person. Where's that in the Bible? So what does the Word of God say? That's our final decision. Not what we think, not what we feel, and certainly not what culture says. This is the final authority, what it says in the Word of God. So we have to take it that way. I must accept the Bible's authority. In addition to that, this is what Jesus said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. How clear is that? And then 2 Timothy, the apostle Paul here, he's in the latter part of his life. This is the last letter he wrote before he was beheaded. Church history tells us he was beheaded in Rome. That's what he says. All scripture is breathed out by God. Now, when he's talking about all scripture here, by this time of his life, he means the Old Testament. That's God's word. He even talks about some of the letters he wrote. Even Peter said some of the scriptures are hard to understand, including the apostle Paul. So even in the early time, we talked about that, right? All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching. Teaching is learning something, all right? Teaching. For reproof, reproof means correcting something. For correction, this is like really correcting someone. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. And for training, training is you learn how to do something, right? In righteousness, that the man, see here it says man, and New Living Translation it would say that the person. And is that, does he mean man and woman? Yes but at least put an asterisk or put a footnote so they know the original language. Because we believe that it's inspired, even the very language it used, okay? That the man of God may be complete. Who wants to be complete? And equipped for every good work. That's what the word of God would have for us. Now, 
The written word is always above the prophetic word. We believe God speaks to us through prophecy, through prophetic words. I sense the Lord. By the way, I'm not making this up. I know it sounds a little self-congratulatory, but it's not. But I had somebody in the past come up to me when I was a single guy. God told me, I'm going to marry you. And, you know, I, I said, well, I, God didn't tell me that. And so I had that problem a lot, as you can imagine, as you can see. I, I'm just kidding. The woman was blind, apparently. No, but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, people would say that. Or God told me to do this. God told me to do that. And, and, and God told me that what you're doing in church is wrong. God say up the Lord. What you're doing in church is wrong. Where is it in the Bible? You know what it says in the Ten Commandments? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Do you know what taking your name in vain is not just saying GD, as bad as that is? What it's saying is, is using God's name in vanity for your own gain. Using his name for your own gain and vanity. That's taking his name. Be careful. If I hear from the Lord, I think I might hear the Lord saying. I don't say thus saith the Lord unless it's the word of the Lord. Careful. We believe in prophetic words. We love prophetic words. But if it goes against this, it's not the word of God. If it violates the principles in the Bible, it's not the word of God. And the Bible says do not despise prophetic utterances, but test how do you test? Through this. The Apostle Paul says that Bereans were really cool. When I preach a sermon, they check their word of God. I hope you check what I'm saying, that you make sure what I'm saying is accurate according to the word of God. Don't take my, don't take my name for it. I'm an imperfect person. The Bible's perfect. Make sure you check out what I'm preaching to you, that it's not just my idea. Check the scriptures, everybody. Seriously. So that's very, very important that we trust the scriptures. The written word is always above the prophetic word. So, I must accept the Bible's authority, and here's another one. The Bible is complete and must not be added or subtracted from. How can you say that? Because the Bible, at the time of the Apostle Paul, most of it was written already, except for John. Later on, he wrote the book of John, the Apostle of Jesus. And by time, about 100 AD, it was pretty much done. There, the other Gospels, the false Gospels, came hundreds of years later. And the early church fathers did not agree with it, neither did the eyewitnesses we talked about. So the word you have, the Old Testament, Jesus said the Old Testament is, is valid. He said that. Jesus said that. Okay? So the word of God is the final canon. Well, how can you say it's the final canon? Why would you say that? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. Because the word of God tells us. In Galatians 1.6, the apostle Paul says the following, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a what? A different gospel. Is there a different gospel? Well, I'm so glad you asked because not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. There are people that are distorting, saying, we only pay attention to the red letters of Jesus. That's not, all scripture is, is valid. Now, same passage of Scripture. Here we go. Apostle Paul. Talking about the Bible. Talking about adding or subtracting to. But even if we, what does we mean? It means even the Apostle Paul. If he were to preach a different gospel than what was already given. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary. That means against the one we have preached to you, let him be a curse. Let him go to hell. Hello? That's not very nice. Well, we're not messing with the word of God. The devastation of pulling the word of God will make things collapse. Now, I, I'm really going to step into it. I'm, I'm hitting all the things today. But you know what? The truth is the truth. There was a man by the name of Muhammad. In 610 AD, an angel came to him, supposedly. So they say it was Gabriel and gave him a different gospel. The Quran began at that point. Later on, there's a whole history of it. We'll have a small group on that eventually. We got people in our church who are experts in this field that used to be uh, into Islam, now they're Christians, and they show the whole thing. But they, they believe this. This is another gospel. It is demonic. And I know it's not nice to say that. The people are wonderful people. We love the Muslim people. We love the different areas. I'm serious. But they're under a delusion. Um, look what it says here. 1 Timothy 4.1 says the following. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits. Now let, let me just say something to you real quick. 
The definition of being deceived. I heard people say this to me sometimes. I'm not deceived. The definition of deception is you don't know you're deceived. <laughs> right? That's why we need each other. Don't be deceived, right? So now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits. Yes, we do not flesh, fight against flesh and blood or spiritual forces in high places. And teaching that come from what? Demons. That's correct. Here we go again. Another, another, we're going to go on another, another cult. Mormonism is a cult. You know what happened to Joseph Smith? By the way, he had a, some historical um, um, accounts talk about him doing drugs. I believe it. Probably smoked too much peyote, if you ask me. But anyhow, Joseph Smith had a visitation of the angel Moroni, which sounds like moron. It does, does it not? And by the way, I'm not making that up. That's where it comes from, by the way. You're just, you're really arrogant. I'm just, okay, hang on. Joseph Smith had a visitation in 1836 in upstate New York, and the angel said, so the demon said, I have these gold tablets for you. Here are these glasses. Put them on and transcribe what you see. So the angel gave it to him, and he transcribed. had many visitations, and he wrote the Book of Mormon. Another gospel. If anyone comes with a different gospel, let them be accursed. How clear is that? All right, no, it's not true. And then he says that there was ancient civilizations that fought each other. You, dig, you, you can dig all you want, you're not going to find anything. You might find a few Viking um, stuff. But that's basically it, everybody, and some Indian relics. You're not going to find these ancient civilizations. It's a lie. Not only is it a lie, but the secrets. Let me say something really clear to you. Anytime there is a secret society, it's a cult. If we start becoming, oh, join Cornerstone, and you come to the inner circle, and we have special knowledge, Baloney, send me a hundred, send me a hundred thousand, send a thousand dollars and God will bless you. That's, that's a bunch of nonsense. Join the inner circle club. You know what? Jesus spoke flat out. There's nothing hidden, everybody. We, what we're saying here is what we say in private. It's what we say in public. When you have secret knowledge, and incidentally, Mormonism stole a lot from Freemasonry. It's a ripoff. But anyhow, don't get me started. We love the Mormon people, and there's some Mormon people that love Jesus and don't even understand the depth of their deception, and I believe they're probably saved because it's faith in Jesus Christ. But it's a demonic deception. Uh, I can go on and on about it, that Jesus and Satan are brothers, please. It's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. And, and so this is the actual, the demon, uh, Moroni. And you can see it. We drive past the temple. Like, my God, we always pray against it. And Lord Jesus, let it. seriously, it's, it's horrible. So, let me bring it back to that again, okay, everybody? I'm, I'm, listen, it, I, we're not saying it arrogantly, but there's something called truth and false. I talked about melanoma on my back. I'm not being judgmental by saying it's poison. This is poison, these, these false religions. But, by the way, in Christianity, we don't force anyone to become a Christian. It's a, your own choice. It's your own choice, okay? So... But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, right? He goes on. As we have said before, he repeats himself like a good dad. So now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. Hello. How clear is that? Then how can you say you're a Christian and that there's no other gospel of Jesus? All you have is this. So, I hope that's clear, everybody, right? I hope that's clear. That's why you need to know the Word of God, okay? Why do people abandon the truth? Why do people abandon the truth? Why do you and I abandon the truth? I've done it. One of the reasons why is the Apostle Paul tells us the reason why. For, I am not, for, for am I now seeking the approval of man? So many times I want to fit into society. I want to fit into my friends. I want to fit into the people at school. And I know they're all doing this and it's okay. And after all, it's okay to do this. And it's okay to do this and live with this person. I know I'm not married to them, but God understands. It's just a piece of paper after all. And we make all these excuses, right? God understands after all. No, approval of man. Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, would I be a servant of Christ? No. Are you, a serv Are you trying to please man or trying to please God? You know what? When it's all said and done, I'm not going to stand before you. 
I'm going to stand before God. And I have to give an account to God, not the United States of America, not to the local governing officials. And so right now it's temporary. So it's God we have to stand before, okay? How the word transform you. Number one, I must accept the Bible's authority. Number two, I must assimilate its truths with the Holy Spirit. I know assimilate sounds like assimilate. Um, what is that all about? Well, it means getting it in you, okay? Uh, getting the truth by the Holy Spirit, by the way. The Holy Spirit will help you. It's, it's your tutor. You have a higher tutor called the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad about that? It will actually come along and help you. The Holy Spirit sits down with me when I read the Word of God and helps me understand the Word of God. It's wonderful. You have a personal tutor called the Holy Spirit, all right? And this is what the Bible says. Do not conform. Do not be shaped by yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform. And transform is the same word from an ugly worm to a caterpillar. I mean, from a caterpillar to a monarch butterfly. That's the word transform, metamorphosis. That's where it comes from. But let God transform you. How? You inwardly. By the what? Complete change of your mind. You need to change your mind. Be careful what you and I think. Then you'll be able to know. The, how many people want to know the will of God? I want to know the will of God. God, what do you want me to do? But you know what I found? God has given us enough of his will that we can obey it. If we obey his will, what we know, he'll show us what we don't know. But if we don't do what we know, why would he give us more? It'd be irresponsible for him as a loving father. Why would you tell your child, even though you can't, even though you crashed the car three times, I'm gonna give you, and now I'm gonna give you a more expensive car? That's irresponsible. So why would God, it's not, not, not legalism, it's called love. Why would I have you be more responsible for something more if you can't handle what you have? So listen to what God says, do what he says, and he'll show you the next step. How do you know that? The Bible says so. Then you'll know the will of God. Now, uh, let me go ahead and give you a little example of what happened to me. Greek word for logos. Logos is actual word. Word. Rhema is the word revealed. Logos is literal word revealed. Let me tell you a story what happened to me. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, uh, I was in, living in Colorado, and I was reading the Bible through the year, by the way, and I got to uh, Proverbs 20.20. It says, he who curses his mother and father will be put in utter darkness. And I read that word. I read it many times before. I read that word. It cut me to the, cut me. And it said, you are dishonoring your dad in your heart. And I had some bitterness toward my father. There's no reason for it. It was my own problem. And I repented. And I cried out and I called my dad up and asked him for forgiveness. Next thing I know, I flew home and I worked with him for two years. Met my wife, Sandra, praise the Lord, and worked it out. Had to work out that issue. But the Lord spoke to me in that. That's a rhema word. When God will use the word you read and speak to you and speak to you personally about it, that's a rhema word. It does not supersede the regular word. And we'll get into that next week about how to do more translations, okay? Of how to understand the Bible. So how do we do it? By listening to God's word. Meditation activates revelation. Now, what is meditation? I described to you already what meditation is. You know what meditation is? When the doctor told me, you have melanoma cancer, guess what I did? I meditated. I thought of everything that could go wrong. I thought of all the things that could go wrong. When you worry, am I going to pass this test? Am I going to get in the university I want to go to? Am I going to get this job? You meditate. You think about. You know what rumination comes from? Word, the word, you know what a cow does? A cow chews grass. Doesn't smoke grass. It chews grass. Okay? Chews grass. Chews it. You know what it does then? This is really, this is wonderful, before we have lunch. It swallows it, and it goes, <clears throat> um, throws it up again in its mouth. I'm not making this up. Chews it again. Some of you eat this way, it's disgusting. You throw it up, <laughs> chews it again, like, swallows it, <clears throat> and does it again. And so it has like seven stomachs or whatever. Don't correct me. I haven't had a chance to look into the cow's stomachs. But it regurgitates it. It throws it up. What you guys need to do is eat the word of God and throw it up. No, eat the word of God and ruminate. Meditation is something we don't understand in our culture. But boy, we're really good at worrying, aren't we? Worrying is meditation. Instead, I can do all things through Christ who saves me. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just and forgives my sins. Although I don't feel forgiven, I thank you, God, that I am forgiven. I thank you that I'm forgiven. 
you're no good, you're no good. What you did was so bad when you were 20. I am forgiven, forgiven in Jesus Christ. Cursed is he that hangs on the tree. He broke the power of sin and death in my life. You quote that scripture. You quote it. You ruminate. You, and this is a weird word to say, but you remember it. You fantasize how the word of God will come true in your life. That's, that's what you call meditation. Okay? And do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate it day and night. That sounds like brainwashing. Exactly. You need to be brainwashed. We're all for brainwashing here. You know what it says in the Bible? Husbands, wash your wife with the word. You need to get, we got a lot of pollution in our minds. We need to wash our minds in Christ, okay? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. You can literally hear. Part of this is today. We're hearing the word of God. You can listen to um, um, uversion.com and you can listen to the Bible for free. And listen to it. If you can't read well, you have a hard time understanding, play it, play it, listen to it, right? So pay attention to how you, this is very important. I need to, as we need to wrap this up here. This is what Jesus says. Pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. A lot of men struggle with hearing their wives. So we go to the ear doctor, audiologist. I can't hear my wife half the time. All the men have trouble with this. I don't know what it is. And, and, the, and the doctor goes, hey, well, you do have some hearing loss. What's the matter? About uh, the frequency 4K? Uh, you're missing that part. Really? Yeah. But I hear people whisper, I understand that, but that one little frequency you've lost. Let me explain how this happens. If you're a factory worker, you work in a factory, you're working on a drill press, and let's suppose that all day long you hear that noise. What happens is you do damage to that frequency in your hearing and you can't hear it anymore. Listen to this. When God speaks to you and tells you to forgive somebody, he says, get right with me. If you ignore that word, the next time it comes, okay, I'll do it next time. You start losing your hearing for God in that area until you lost complete hearing. So if God's calling you to give your life to him today, do it today. If God tells you to make it right with your father, your mother, or whoever it is, don't delay when God speaks. Because pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But... For those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away. This is why we have the chaos in our culture. The Bible says, although they knew God, they denied him and did not have thankful hearts, exchanging the truth for a lie, began to worship the creation instead of the creator. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You deny the truth. You lose the hearing. You become deaf. You become blind. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand, it will be taken from them. How do we have it in our lives? By listening to God's word. Meditation. By reading God's word. And we don't have time for this today. But Jesus says this. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Feeding on the word of God. I'm going to do two more minutes about this and we'll conclude. Okay, just want to give you some practical things. Okay, I want to go through that, but let's go ahead. I encourage you to get a Bible. If you don't have one, go take one. We have it on the back table. Do we have to pay? No, we, you better pay for it, your tithes and offerings. Go ahead, take one. Okay, take a Bible. Get a paper Bible. Why? Because you know what? If you're like, maybe, maybe you have more discipline than I do, but when I have my device, oh, let me see what, about that word. And then all of a sudden I, I see a news article, something that someone tweeted. And then off to the races, right? So get a paper Bible if you can. You don't have to, but set aside a time. I mean, imagine you tell someone, you, I'm going to give you some dating advice. And for those of you looking to, to start dating, if you want to date somebody, you go, hi, how you doing? Good. Let's go out sometime. Great. When? Eh, whenever. First of all, the woman's going to go, I don't want to go out with that guy. He doesn't know what he wants. Set aside a time. If you're married, Let's go out. When? I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? <laughs> Have a plan. Let's go to, I'm not going to say Chick-fil-A, but let's go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> let's go to Chipotle. Okay. I'm, I'm mentioning all the places I like. Um, but let's, let's go. Let's go to, have a plan. 
All right, let, let's, okay, I'll pick you up at seven and let's go to uh, whatever. Let's go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, okay? And uh, let's go there and take out a second mortgage. Um, <laughs> so that's what you got to do. You don't just get in a car and just drive. You got to have a plan. If you just read the Bible, what do you want to do? I don't know. You're going to be, you're going to be reading about some, you're going to be reading about a salamander. You'll be reading about mold on the wall and a skin disease. You're like, I don't get this. So well, let, me, let me give you some advice. I, I have a Bible reading plan that works for me. I gotta just tell you what I do. You can go to uversion.com. They have, you can read through the New Testament, the Proverbs, the Psalms, what I do. I've been doing it for 20 years. I can say that now because I'm getting older. I read through the Bible, the one year Bible. It's fantastic. Let me tell you the reason why. Because I go through the Old Testament and sometimes you're into the salamanders in the walls. Okay. And so I'm getting nothing out of that one today although other times I read it and the Lord speaks to me. Then there's a New Testament passage. Usually I get something out of that. And if I don't get anything out of the new and the old, guess what I give me? It gave me a psalm. It's awesome. And a proverb. And nearly every day I write down what I see. I'll underline the word of God. I'll pray over what I see. I'll meditate, think about how it means. And let me tell you, I can't tell you how my life has changed by reading this word. Single-handedly, the greatest thing that I do every day is hear God through the word. My friends, you need a plan. Get a paper Bible, just, you don't have to, but more importantly, set a time and have a plan by exploring God's word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And what is sin? Sin is pulling a block out of God's structure that would do you damage. That's really what sin is, everybody. He's not limiting your fun, he's actually helping you. This is what it's all about. You see, the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge. The Bible was given to change our lives. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. And finally, this is so important. If you love me, obey my commandments. God, it's not like, this is what God's saying. If you really love me, you obey my commandments. If you really love me, no, that's not what he's saying. I woke you up. What he's saying is this. If you would really love me, you obey my commandments. When I spend time, more time with my, my wife, Sandra, the more I love her, the more of a protection is for me. You know, if you love me, you obey my commandments. So it's not about trying not to do stuff. It's loving God more. Well, how do you love God more? Spend time with him. I have good news for you. If you have any desire to go towards God, he's, he's already there. And I want to encourage you to fall more in love with Jesus. That's the key to obeying his word. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I want to thank you so much for today, and I thank you for your word. And Lord, all of us in this room, myself included, need you ter terribly, Lord. We need you. We need you, Lord. We've, there are areas of our lives right now, and myself included, that we're not obeying your word. We've turned a blind eye to what you've said. And Father, I just pray right now, I just, I just believe there's at least a couple of you here today that are writing yourself off that God can't use you because of your past. And God would say, that's not true. What I call clean is clean. And so it's not a good thing for you to beat yourself up. God is not happy with that because he loves you. And you need to take that and receive that today in Jesus' name. Some of you need to forgive other people and you've chosen not to. God says do it. Some of you have never admitted you've been wrong about anything because you're afraid you'll be rejected. God would say, do it. And so Father, with areas of our lives, now Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that Cornerstone Church, this church would be a known for a place where we love your word Father, we would come here on Sundays, we would meet in small groups, and we'd be bubbling over with excitement of what you showed us in your word every week. God, give us an appetite for your word where it would change our lives in Jesus' name. Father, we want to live by your word, stand on your word, and we know when the difficult times come, we'll be still be standing in Jesus' name.